Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we're going to take a brief look at what just might be the newest creationist idea out there and see how an experiment from over 80 years ago disproves it. Now if you're familiar with creationist arguments, you know there isn't a whole lot of innovation, let's say, whether you're talking about young earth or old earth, most of what you read now hasn't changed that much in the last 20 years. Really, the only changes that we've seen are the arguments from creationists get more sophisticated with like more like genetic data, for example. So they're talking more specifically about this gene or that sequence, but the underlying arguments haven't actually changed. Much of it could be lifted from the 1980s or even all the way back in like the 1960s. In fact, there's this wonderful YouTube channel showing a screenshot right here that has dozens of Dwayne Gish debates going back decades. And you can go and pick any one of them basically at random and you'll hear arguments that are basically identical to what you're going to hear today out of the major creationist ministries. I've linked that channel down below. Highly recommend you check it out. Just pick one and you'll see how it's exactly the same as what you hear today. Right down to some prominent creationists today are imitating like the mannerisms of Dwayne Gish from decades ago. But there is one relatively new creationist argument out there, Continuous Environmental Tracking, or CET. This is mostly promoted by the Institute for Creation Research, ICR, and its president, Dr. Randy Galusa. If you follow online creationism, you may have noticed CET making inroads into other venues as well recently, which I find pretty surprising, since one of ICR's big things is that natural selection isn't actually a real process. And most creationists, even young earthers, for example, Jason Lyle and Nathaniel Jensen, uh, at least accept that natural selection happens, right? They, of course, dispute tons of other aspects of biology and evolutionary theory, but most creationists, even young earthers, will at least acknowledge that natural selection is a real process that occurs in nature. In this short video, we're going to briefly explain uh, what continuous environmental tracking is, and show how an experiment from the 1940s disproves this newest creationist idea. As far as I can tell, continuous environmental tracking was dreamt up sometime between 2011 and 2017. This ICR article from 2011 attempts to refute natural selection as a mechanism of evolution, but there's no specific mention of CET as an alternative, so it really only has half the picture. Dr. Randy Galuza presented the other side of the argument, the alternative to selection, at the 2016 Creation Biology Society Annual Conference with a talk titled Environmental Tracking, Theoretical Considerations of Engineered Mechanisms Within Populations to cont Continually Fill the Earth Across Generations. Okay, now, if you look at the abstract of that talk, which you can find published for free, I'll link it down below, in the abstract, the phrase continuous environmental tracking appears, but it's not yet capitalized. So in this particular instance from 2016, Galuza is using the phrase to describe the mechanism he's talking about, but not as the actual name of the mechanism or of the model of biological origins. Now, if you jump forward to the August 2017 issue of Acts and Facts, a monthly publication from ICR, you'll find an article by Galuza in which he uses the same phrase, but this time it's capitalized as the actual name of both the proposed mechanism and the broader theoretical framework that explains biological change out in nature. By the way, shout out to RJ Downer for helping me track down these early mentions of CET. If you aren't familiar with RJ, he's a walking encyclopedia of creationist claims and sources. I've linked his channel down below. Everybody should check it out and subscribe. So by 2017, we've solidified the concept of continuous environmental tracking. And this is basically the idea that organisms will detect their environment in some way and then respond in a 
conscious or directed or purposeful way to the environmental conditions in order to better survive and reproduce in that environment. Basically, in contrast to natural selection, where you're generating variation and then nature is kind of picking winners and losers from among all those variants, in the CET model, of adaptation, you have organisms detecting the environment and then everybody's going to respond or some fraction of the population will respond or the members of the population will respond to those conditions at some rate and that will be in a non-random, purposeful, directed, whatever word you want to use kind of way. Uh, Dr. Galuza describes this as an engineering framework or an engineering approach to looking at biodiversity and adaptation. I believe, at least as of this recording in 2025, this is the newest actual creationist like argument and term that they've come up with, uh, beating the modern form of the irreducible complexity argument from 1996, genetic entropy from 2005, and created heterozygosity, which goes back at least to 2016. But ironically, despite being the new kid on the block, CET is invalidated by a classic experiment from 1943. In the 1940s, in the relatively early days of the fields of genetics and molecular biology, the actual mechanism of adaptation was still very much an open question. Remember, this is before we knew that DNA was responsible for inheritance and what the structure of DNA was and how the genetic code actually worked. So one aspect that needed to be answered, one question that needed to be answered, was whether organisms adapted to their environment through selection operating on pre-existing randomly generated variation due to mutations, or through the induction of specific changes in response to specific environmental conditions or pressures or stimuli, however you want to say it. So two biologists, Salvador Loria and Max Delbrook, came up with an experiment to evaluate these alternatives and determine which better explained the appearance of new adaptive traits in a population. They looked at how bacteria responded to the presence of bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. And specifically, they were looking at the rate at which resistance to the viruses evolved across lots of separate bacterial populations. So you start with a population of bacteria, you split it off into a bunch of subgroups, and then you let those groups grow. You let the bacteria, you know, divide and you let that population reach whatever its final size is going to be. And then you infect them with the bacteriophage to see the frequency of resistance across those different populations. And they did this in such a way that allowed them to test competing predictions from the two competing models of adaptation. If the bacteria were detecting the presence of the viruses in some way and responding by uh, developing resistance as kind of a purposeful adaptation, we'd expect an approximately equal rate of resistance across all of the trials of the experiment. All of these different independent populations should develop resistance at approximately the same rate. If, on the other hand, resistance mutations appeared randomly as a result of probabilistic mutations, then as the bacterial populations grow, different populations are going to stumble upon resistance mutations at different times. And we would expect the frequency of resistance to exhibit a wide variation across all of those different trials. For some of those populations, very early in its history, you might find a resistance mutation, and that might be inherited by many of the offspring, whereas other populations may not find a resistance mutation until much more recently, or maybe not at all. So we'll see a wide variation in how much resistance we see across these different populations. The beautiful thing here is we have two competing hypotheses and two very different, very specific predictions. If we see an approximately equal rate of resistance across all of those different populations, then that's consistent with the hypothesis that each population is detecting the presence of the phage and responding to it in some purposeful way. If we see lots of variation across those different populations, then that's a refutation of the proposal that they're 
detecting and responding to those viruses. Instead, that observation is consistent with the idea that mutations are occurring as those populations grow, and some of the populations at various times discovered resistance mutations. And the results? Luria and Delbrook documented extremely large variations in the frequency of bacteriophage resistance. Some populations exhibited resistance very rarely, while in others, resistance was very common. And that answers the question. We had our two competing hypotheses. Was it a purposeful response to the phages, or was it just luck that you happened to have the mutations at some point in your history? The answer is that some of the populations had the mutations for resistance and others didn't. And I want to be crystal clear here. If CET was an accurate model of how adaptation occurs, the various populations would have evolved resistance at approximately the same rate. We'd see approximately equal frequency of resistance across all of these different populations. That's a direct necessity from the CET model, which means these results, these direct observations, are a direct refutation of continuous environmental tracking and are only consistent with the mainstream understanding of the mechanisms underpinning natural selection, mutations occurring probabilistically, and then natural selection operating on the resulting variation. Certain genotypes become more common over time because they're more fit for that environment, they're better adapted. Other genotypes become less frequent over time because they are less well adapted to that particular environment. That's it. It's not more complicated than that. This experiment was published in 1943. It refutes continuous environmental tracking. And you don't have to take my word for it, because I'm going to do something right now that I almost never do. I am going to cite and agree with a Young Earth Creationist Ministry, because this right here is from Creation Ministries International talking about why continuous environmental tracking is wrong. And wouldn't you know it, as I was putting together my outline for this video, and I was going to the various other creation ministries, right, other than ICR, to see if they had said anything about CET. And wouldn't you know it, Creation Ministries International has. And on in their article talking about why CET is wrong, they say the exact thing that I just said that the Luria-Delbrook experiment from 1943 refutes continuous environmental tracking. Isn't that amazing, folks? I agree with some young Earth creationists when it comes at least to telling other young Earth creationists why they're wrong. I don't know if the folks at ICR are unaware of this experiment. Famous as it is, it's from the 1940s, so who knows? Or if they are aware of it, they're just ignoring it, or they're pretending that the interpretation isn't what it very clearly is. But either way, this old experiment, published in 1943, refutes this very new creationist idea. And for anyone watching who might find themselves encountering continuous environmental tracking in the wild as a creationist argument, here's a simple refutation that I hope you can all use. Luria Delbrook experiment from 1943. Thank you all for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Hit like and leave a comment before you go. Share this video around, especially if continuous environmental tracking ever comes up. And if you are so inclined, if you really love what I do here and want to support it, please consider becoming a channel member. As I've said, channel members get immediate access to my pre-recorded videos instead of waiting for the public release. Thank you all again for watching, and don't get fooled.